The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men, who have turned the world upside down, have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Amen. Well, just a brief prayer. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For your Son's sake, amen. Well, I thought it would be nice to spend uh, the time in the company of the Apostle Paul. Um, He's a man who gets a a varied press, as you will know. And yet, as we study him, we realize what what a unique gift he is to the church. Let me say uh, two or three things by way of introduction. Say something about geography, something about history, something about biography. Uh, First of all, you will see that the geographical note is right there in the text. Uh, This is because this really happened. I have to remind people of this all the time, that when we read the Bible, we're actually reading, in this case, history, and we are able to go to contemporary maps and find the very places, albeit with different names, that are mentioned before us now. Uh, Most recently, Paul and Silas had arrived here uh, from Philippi. You'd have to backtrack, and I didn't bring the whole Bible for you, but if you go back into the previous chapter, you can realize there that the events in Philippi were certainly not humdrum. Uh, They ended up in jail, and uh, as a result of their time in the jail, Uh, the fellow who was responsible for looking after them actually became a follower of Jesus. But things were so amazingly tense that they had essentially to get them out under cover of darkness, and so they began this journey. The distance from Philippi to Amphipolis is about 33 miles. From Amphipolis to Apollonia, another 35 miles. And from Apollonia to Thessalonica, another 35 miles. So if they were walking, it was a pretty fair journey. If they were riding on horses, it probably would have taken them two or three days at least. That's the geography. The history is brief, simply to acknowledge that Thessalonica, uh, which was a Roman province like Philippi, became a free city in 42 BC. And as soon as it established its own framework of politics, it adopted a Greek pattern in terms of the way in which they assembled themselves and controlled the events of life. The biography relates to the one whose company we are now joining, and that is this man, Saul of Tarsus. There are a number of places where we can go in the Acts of the Apostles and elsewhere that give to us, in his own words, uh, who and what he was. For example, this is him speaking to a crowd. Uh, Later on, it's recorded in Acts 22. And he introduces himself in this way. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, uh, i.e. Jerusalem. So born outside of Jerusalem, brought up in Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. The reason Gamaliel is mentioned is because he was a very well-known teacher, and it gave Paul a certain amount of kudos to say that he had been taught by him. Being zealous for God... I persecuted this way, 
And that two-word uh, phrase there is a reference to the followers of Jesus. They were known as the way. You remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, so I was persecuting uh, this way, persecuting it to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. So that is not his entire resume, but it is enough for us to realize that this is the record of a religious man, zealous for God, who hated Jesus and who hated the followers of Jesus. A couple of things happened to him along the journey that were to change him forever. One is not mentioned in this way, but I'm convinced of the accuracy of what I suggest to you. You're sensible people, you can consider it, <clears throat> and you can read your Bibles and see. What I'm referencing is the impact on Saul of Tarsus by the first Christian martyr, namely Stephen. And in the earlier chapters of Acts, particularly in Acts chapter 6, you realize in this great speech that Stephen makes that he is upholding the continuity of the plans and purposes of God from the very beginning of time all the way through to his own life and his own experience of Jesus. Well, of course, because he spoke so clearly about Jesus, he infuriated people. And uh, Luke records for us that when the crowd came to stone uh, Stephen, the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So here we have the first introduction to Saul in the Acts of the Apostles. And basically, he's a cloakroom attendant, and he is looking after the jackets. He's prepared to say, I will not throw a stone, but you can lay your coats here. In other words, I will enable you to do what is really this dreadful deed. Now, the reason I say that he was unsettled by that is because I can't imagine that he wasn't unsettled by that. Later on, when he talks about his own conversion, he says that he was provoked. He was provoked to jealousy, but he gives no indication of where uh, this indication, where this jealousy uh, was provoked in him. I think it was here. I think it was when he saw this young man whose face shone like an angel, prepared to bear testimony to the way and then to die for it, that he realized that despite his zeal for God, despite his intellectual acumen, despite his background and so on, he did not have what this fellow had. Now, in my experience, limited as it is of some 68 years, when I listen to people tell me their story of coming to faith in Jesus, it is not uncommon for them to tell me that there was someone in their office or there was someone on the sports team or there was something that happened along the way. And although they at that time had no interest in the things that that person professed, now looking back on it, they say, you know, that was the early trigger for me. That started me off on this journey. It certainly is true, the next part. If that uh, is open to speculation, which it is, since it's, it's my opinion, um, we can categorically say that he was changed by the encounter he had with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go through all of this. I haven't printed it out, and therefore it's homework for later. You can read it in Acts chapter 9. And in Acts chapter 9, we have the record, of course, of the encounter of Saul of Tarsus uh, with um, uh, Jesus. It was a unique event. And uh, because it is such a unique event, uh, people will often say, well, of course, I hope you're not one of these people that talks about these great dramatic conversions like the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Well, uh, the Bible is just giving us the record of various conversions, and it gives us the record there. Well, do I have to have an encounter like that, be struck blind by a shining light and fall down on the road and so on? No, absolutely not. But the things, the elements that were involved in the change of Saul of Tarsus are elements that will be involved in the life of everyone who is changed by the gospel. This is not all that is involved, but these three things certainly are involved. When a person is converted 
to faith in Jesus Christ, number one, they will have a brand new notion of Jesus. They will change their mind about who Jesus is. Before a person becomes a follower of Jesus, they may have him as a great moral teacher. They may be prepared to say that he was a fine man, that he was something of a philosopher, that he established various things throughout the world. And on the strength of that, they carry on. But when they meet Jesus, oh no, the view changes. They no longer refer to him as a possible savior, but they refer to him as my savior. Secondly, they will have a new view of the church or of the followers of Jesus. You see that in Saul of Tarsus. He was, by his own testimony, zealous for God, persecuting the followers of Jesus and driving them into the jail and beyond that into extinction. But now it's all changed. Now when he goes to a place, he goes to look for the followers of Jesus. Now he calls himself a brother as to the sisters and to the brothers within the community. That's the second thing. And the third thing is that when a person is converted as per Saul of Tarsus, he will have or she will have an entirely new view of mercy, of mercy. You see, Paul, because of his background, because of his intelligence, because of the nature of life that he'd enjoyed, he was like so many people that we know. He was, if you like, a good man, convinced that God rewards good men if they just do their best. And that was until he came right up against this problem, first in Stephen, and then secondly in Jesus. And suddenly he realized that the mercy that is provided by God was a mercy that he needed. Well, we find this in different places, don't we? We find it in Mer Mer uh, the Merchant of Venice when Portia is, is speaking to, uh, to Shylock. And Shylock is trying to work his, work his deal. And remember, she says to him, Though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. If you say, I only want what I deserve, look out. I mean, if some of you here are corporate fellows and corporate ladies and so on, and you have the person come in, the photographer, she comes in or he comes in to take your photograph for your brochure. And uh, you tell your wife or you tell your husband, I'm trying to look my best. And when the person sits you down, you're tempted to say to them, you know, I, make sure that this does me justice. <laughs> and after they've looked through the lens, they said, sir, what you require is not justice, <laughs> but mercy. By nature, we do not believe we need mercy. Only when we encounter Jesus do we understand it. So, geography, history, biography. He was a man, a new man, a new man with a message, a new man with a mission. He's no longer a persecutor, now he's a proclaimer. The message that he has is not a message that he invented, but is a message that has been given to him. And it's been given to him to take to the whole world. And in case we miss the point, the very fact that we are here today in this nation, able to do what we're doing, is actually directly tied to what was happening in the Acts of the Apostles in Acts chapter 17 and in elsewhere. That the message of the gospel spread out from there, from J J J Jerusalem to Judea and to the very ends of the earth. Now, it's on account of that that he goes out to do what he's been told to do. He doesn't go out to give good advice as to how we might make ourselves acceptable to God. He goes out to proclaim good news about what God has done so that we might know him and enjoy him forever. That's a huge distinction. If you get that, you get this. Namely, that the story of the gospel is not good news or good advice about what we need to do. It is good news about what God has already done. So that that moves then when we understand it, our trust from our doing to our trust in what God has done. Now it's on account of that, that he arrives here in Thessalonica and the text tells us what he does. I only want to draw out uh, just two aspects of it. You'll be relieved to know and um, you can fill in the blanks yourself. First of all, to notice that when they had arrived, as was his custom, uh, in other words, he had a pattern in his life 
We all establish patterns, and they can be good ones or bad ones, but it was his pattern uh, to go to where there was a place of worship. He went to join the Jews. He didn't simply go there, as it turns out, because his background was in Judaism, but he went there as a changed man, as if you like a completed Jew, as a, as a new man, in order that he might tell his friends about what had happened to him. And so on three Sabbath days, notice he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. That's the first of two things we want to notice. First of all, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. In other words, he encouraged them to think. Now, there's a novel approach, isn't it? He encouraged them to actually think. Uh, in the Wall Street Journal some time ago, I made a note of it. Um, I, I was fascinated by it because I'd been feeling it for a long time as I watched the end mainly of, uh, of uh, PGA golf tournaments. And I, I've noticed something over time that uh, as you get to the end of these tournaments, depending on who the commentator is, the, the piano music comes in a bit like uh, Augusta uh, or, or, or the violin music, and they start now to weave a story about whoever it is is coming up the, the 18th fairway, about where his uncle was and used to live in Blair Gowrie and stuff like that, but he had a terrible fall off a cliff, you know, in the Highlands or something like that. And all of a sudden, we're saying to ourselves, what the world is this? We're trying to see who wins the tournament. But no, they're moving it in that direction. This is no time for thinking. This is the time for feeling, you see. You must feel this. And when they bring them off, what do they ask them? They don't ask them, how did you do that? They ask them, how did you feel when that happened? <laughs> now, here's the, quote, here's the quote from the Wall Street Journal. We are awash in media-generated emotion. How do you feel has replaced what happened as the obligatory question reporters ask? Well, I didn't make that up. That was a reporter in the Wall Street Journal uh, calling herself out. But there you have it. Now, I don't want to be unkind to many of my fellow preachers, but uh, it's not uncommon for, for the congregation to say this. So, goodness gracious, we're just going to get flushed out here on, a, on a, a wash of emotion. And many men, I think, are prepared to say, you know, if, if that's what that character is up to, I, I really have no interest on it at all. I, I, I want something a little more reasonable than that. Well, of course, we now live at a period where the idea is that if you have any uh, interest in faith, certainly in a believing faith in Jesus, then it must be somehow or another that you have pivoted away from the realm of the rational, from the realm of the thoughtful, from the realm of the consideration, and you've adopted this whole new place. Well, no, not at all. Not in terms of the apostolic gospel. Not in terms of the approach of Paul. So he spent his time Reasoning with them from the Scriptures, he spent his time explaining and proving. Explaining and proving. This is hard work. Aided by his legal background for sure, he is then going to the Scriptures. What Scriptures? The Old Testament, their Bible. And so he is going to the Bible as his source material, and he is going to explain to them from these passages in the Old Testament and prove to them that the Christ, that is the Messiah, for whom his Jewish brothers and sisters were waiting and watching, that this Messiah had to suffer and die. That's his first point. He can't go to his second point until he deals with that, because the notion of a suffering Messiah, a dying Christ, was anathema to them. It was, it was ridiculous. And so he had to do his very, very best. Remember, that was his background, too. He thought it ridiculous, crazy, enough to, ex to exterminate the people who propounded such a ridiculous theory. Now he is explaining, and he's proving. Well, of course, what is he doing? He's only doing what Jesus himself did. As the disciples become followers of Jesus, and as they track with him through his life, on three, at least three memorable occasions, he sort of stops in his tracks and he says to them, fellows, you need to understand this. You need to understand this, that the Messiah has to go up to Jerusalem, be beaten at the hands of cruel men, suffer, die, and be raised on the third day. And he told them that, but they didn't get it. And even after the resurrection, 
when two men on the Easter Sunday, as we call it, were making their way down the road, they were encountered by Jesus without knowing that it was the risen Christ. And he essentially says to them, how is it going? Oh, they said, it's terrible. Are you the only person around Jerusalem that doesn't know what's been happening here these last few days? Which is a fantastic irony, given that they're speaking to Jesus. And Jesus says to them, oh, you know what, boys? How, how foolish you are and how slow of heart you are to believe all that the Scriptures said. You see what he says? You just haven't been reading your Bibles. And then beginning with the Scriptures, beginning with the law, beginning with Moses, going through the prophets, going through the Psalms, he laid out for them the great panorama that was fulfilled in himself. Now, you see, it would have been impossible for any of us to hear a talk by Paul, one Saul of Tarsus, without being brought to this point, because this was his M.O. This is how he did it as a converted Jew. I have to be able to convince you, first of all, about the necessity of this Messiah dying in the place of sinners. And then to his second point, which is our second point, and also at the same time, our last point. What was he doing? He was reasoning with them from the Scriptures, and he was proclaiming Jesus. This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. There was nothing wishy-washy about Paul in his preaching. He was absolutely straightforward. He wouldn't have been keen on a sort of dialogical approach whereby he said, well, what do you think? And what do you think? And so on. No, no, he was a persuasive character. He was, he was like a very good car salesman. You know, you really should smell this leather. You should, have you sat in this? I mean, have you? Yeah. I mean, goodness gracious, there must be some amazing boat salespeople around this place. <laughs> the amount of money you characters are spent on boats are that, that, so the sales pitch has got to be very, very good. And you, at the same time, have got to be very, very, well, very, very a couple of other things. But anyway, that's how it, that's how it all comes together. So he proclaims Jesus. It's proclamation. It's not just the odd suggestion. No, he must have started with eternity. The, 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 the one who always was and is and is to come. The birth, the life the miracles, the healings, the animosity, the beating, the killing, the dying, the rising, the returning, and showing them all from the Old Testament, putting, if you like, together for them all the pieces. And what he's essentially doing is this is how his thing goes. First of all, he argues that the Messiah had to suffer and die this Messiah, he says, that had to suffer and die is that Jesus. This Messiah is that Jesus. I have many Jewish friends whom I love and they love me. And this is the point of departure. This Messiah is that Jesus. My friends, he either is or he isn't. You can't play the Jane Fonda game on the, um, on the Dick Cavett show, where she's on the Dick Cavett show with the then Archbishop of Canterbury. And in the course of conversation, Cavett gets them onto this program. And the, 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 the Archbishop of Canterbury says, you know, Jane, uh, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, you know. And she says, well, he might be the Messiah for you, but he isn't the Messiah for me. To which the archbishop replies, Jane, either he is or he isn't. And that is what he does here. He puts it all together. He puts the expectation alongside the fulfillment, showing them that when Jesus came, he stands on the stage of human history and he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. You see what I mean? That he stands as the fulcrum in time. In fact, the coming of Jesus is the pivotal event of all of human history. All of human history. Not just the history of the Bible. 
And so it is that uh, he makes it clear to them that if you like, the Bible is a two-act drama. A two-act drama. I, I was hoping I'd get my picture up here maybe before I finish these three weeks because it's quite a crew you have on the back wall. And um, I've, I've only been, I think I've only been in for a performance a couple of times, and I don't know if you do two-act dramas. But if, if you do dr dramas in two acts, then you know it's very important to get there for the beginning. Because if you only show up at half time, you won't know how the thing started. And if you only show up for the second half, you'll annoy the person sitting next to you by constantly going, who is that? Who is that about? What's that about? So the Bible is a two-act drama. If you show up only at Matthew's gospel, you won't, you'll have a thousand questions. Where does all this fit? And if you stop at Malachi, you'll be left saying, well, is there an end to this? And so you take the picture on the front of the jigsaw box, and you've got the picture, but it seems there's pieces missing. Now his preaching... He reasoned with them. This is not unreasonable. He explained and he proved. His talks were candid. No concealment of the truth. They were clear. No, ex no obscurity in his expression. And they were confident because he had no fear of the con consequences. How unlike so many contemporary sermons. I have lived here now for some 38 years. I observe the trajectory both within and outside the church. I determine that young people are not ditching because they have considered the evidence and found it wanting, but rather because they have determined that it is just trivial, trivial. And how did they get to that conclusion? By listening to people talking in such a way as to suggest that it may well be. In the year I was born, 1952, a very good Presbyterian minister from Edinburgh, James S. Stewart, gave the Yale Divinity Lectures and warned men moving towards the Presbyterian ministry in America. 68 years ago, he warned them of, quotes, a hopelessly vague and harmlessly accommodating Christianity, which in the end, he said, is less than useless. He was absolutely right. He was right. Now, what happened uh, as, as uh, he did, did his talks? Well, the impact was interesting. It was, it was divisive, wasn't it? You can read it for yourselves. There were conversions. There were some who decided that they would go along with him. Some were persuaded. They joined him. Devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women. How often we see that. Their husbands dragging behind, arguing the cause of their intellect. It's just because they're downright lazy and they won't read the Bible. And so a great few men, not a few of the leading women, were there at the very front of the church. But the Jews were jealous. And then you can read, they created a, a mob scene, similar to what we've seen in Seattle and in Minneapolis and various things, but with a very different genesis. And as a result of that, and because they couldn't get a hold of Paul and Silas, uh, they took a hold of his host and did what they could with them, but eventually it all evaporated and uh, they had to make a run for it. And since it's now quarter to 10, I would like to make a run for it as well. <laughs> but let me end in this way. The question at the end of his talk was not, where are we going for lunch? The question at the end of his talk was, do I believe this or do I not believe it? Do I believe it enough to enlist, as it were, alongside him in the army of faith? Or will I go out and join the rabble in the streets, crying that we want to hear no more of this? Well, I'm pretty sure that later in the week, if we could have been there uh, and uh, we're down in the market, uh, we would have met at least some who said, you know, it was on one of those Sabbaths uh, when Saul was there, one of those Sabbaths that the penny dropped, that the jigsaw was completed. It was on one of those Sabbaths that I actually believed. I wonder... 
if one of these Sundays will be that kind of Sunday for somebody here. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.